Not yet. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, hello and welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher Midday Lecture. Uh, I'm Adam Smith, I'm the Programme Director at University College London and I'm delighted to welcome today Dr Daniel Erskine. Hi Dan. Hi. Uh, I followed Dan on Twitter for quite some time but, it's, uh, uh, but it was really back when I saw him present at the AIC uh, in July that I became familiar with his work and was Oh, it was really fantastic and interesting and was inspired by that. So I contacted Dan to ask if he would uh, like to record a webinar on come on a, uh, or, or do a podcast with us. And we arrived at the conclusion that I think there was so much detail and, and it would benefit from slides and things. So we decided to go down the route of uh, the webinar. Uh, Dan is an Alzheimer's Research UK fellow at Newcastle University. And today he's gonna to talk to us about his uh, research describing a series of post-mortem studies aiming at to understand why Lewy bodies form, their relevance to cellular health, and their ro role in, uh, uh, in developing symptoms of Lewy body dementia. Um, the talk will be around 20 minutes, and then we have time for questions at the end. If you think of a question at any time throughout Dan's presentation today, you can post that using the Q&A button in Zoom, or if you're watching us via YouTube, you can use the chat box, the comment box below the video stream to, to post your questions. And then at the end, I will put those to Dan for you. Um, so thank you very much. We are also recording today's uh, webinar. So if for some reason you need to drop out or you can't stay to the end or have tech problems, don't worry, you can come back to our YouTube channel or our website, uh, probably from sometime tomorrow to be able to catch up on what you missed. So thank you very much, everybody for joining us. And uh, Dan, over to you if you'd like to share your screen now. Wonderful, thank you very much. And just to begin by, by thanking Adam very much for inviting me to present here. And also to all of you for coming in the middle of the day, as I imagine lots of people have been quite uh, busy. So um, yeah, so the, the, the topic that I'm gonna talk about is something that I find really interesting, which is neural vulnerability in Lewy body dementia. Um, I hope by the end of this that uh, you'll also find it very interesting, uh, perhaps for the same reasons. So uh, just to begin, I appreciate many people may know this, but just to, to sort of start at the beginning, uh, Lewy body dementia is a, is a general term really for two different uh, distinct clinical disorders, which is Parkinson's disease dementia, which is dementia that occurs in the context of established Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies, which is a dementia disorder um, in which Parkinsonian movement symptoms often occur um, at a later stage of the disease. So in a nutshell, Parkinson's disease dementia is a movement disorder followed by a dementia disorder, uh, whereas dementia with Lewy bodies is a dementia disorder that is often followed by a movement disorder. And the core clinical features of these two disorders are, are, are similar and overlapping, but, but somewhat distinct. Um, for ease, I'll just really focus on the main ones that are quite similar between both um, and they're distinguished quite a bit from, from the likes of Alzheimer's disease, which is primarily an amnestic disorder. Um, so Lewy body dementia tends to be, be um, uh, characterized by Parkinsonian movement features, um, often neuropsychiatric symptoms such as Parkinsonism, uh, sorry, such as visual hallucinations, um, changes to one's uh, attention, attention and arousal over time, which is known as fluctuating cognition and REM sleep behavior disorder. Despite different clinical uh, sequence of clinical symptoms, the one thing these disorders share in common is the same characteristic neuropathological feature, which is Lewy bodies, uh, the accumulation of the protein alpha synuclein within vulnerable neurons. And the, I would say that the, the canonical view in the field is Lewy bodies, which are these uh, large intracellular structures um, that are immunoreactive for the protein alpha synuclein, form within Lewy bodies, uh, sorry, form within neurons and the Formation of the Lewy body induces a state of cellular stress and ultimately the death of a neuron. Um, and it's thought that the loss of particularly important populations of neurons with particularly important functions underlies clinical features. So an example of this would be Lewy bodies form in the dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra. This leads to depletion of the nigrostriadal um, dopaminergic pathway, which underlies clinical Parkinsonism. And that's quite well established. But there's a few things I don't really like about this hypothesis. The idea that, that Lewy bodies kill cells, which equals symptoms. 
The first of which is that it makes a huge assumption, which is that all neurons would be equally vulnerable to the same insult, which doesn't seem to be biologically plausible because neurons are a, are a pretty broad church uh, of cells and they differ in terms of their vulnerability to particular stressors. Um, it also assumes that all the wee bodies are the same. And it's not something I'm gonna to touch on today, but I think there's good evidence to think that, that alpha synuclein aggregates are also quite a heterogeneous um, class of protein aggregate that may differ in terms of their toxicity. But uh, to go back to the idea of all neurons being similarly vulnerable to the same insult. So I think most people will know, or at least have read, that Lewy body pathology is postulated to develop in a sequence uh, that gives the impression that it spreads through the brain. And in Parkinson's disease, at least, this is thought to begin in brainstem regions, passing through limbic areas, and ultimately ending up in the neocortex. Um, so in other words, at the end stage, Lewy bodies are pretty well distributed throughout the brain. So one would assume, therefore, that if Lewy bodies are distributed throughout the brain, that there would be quite widespread neuronal loss in Lewy body disease. Um, but if we use the most gross measure of cell loss um, in a brain, which is brain weight, and this is data compiled um, by me at Newcastle Brain Tissue Resource, where we prospectively take human brain specimens uh, from individuals with dementia. If we look at every brain since 2010, you can see that dementia with Lewy bodies, the, which we specialize in at Newcastle, so we, we have most brains of, of this type, um, is no different from control in terms of its mass. Whereas Alzheimer's disease, which is well, has well-described widespread neuronal loss, um, has quite obvious loss uh, of brain weight as a result of the neurodegenerative process. And that's a bit of a gross measure. It's just really for illustrative purposes. But if we actually look at the published literature of Lewy body diseases, um, including Lewy body dementias, one thing that, that really jumps out to me is that if we look at the regions that have well described neural loss. One thing that they all share in common is that these are regions of the brain that are highly active. So they contain neurons that are very active all of the time. Um, and we know from literature in other diseases, particularly metabolic diseases, that these particular populations of neurons uh, are very highly reliant upon cellular energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate or ATP, which is produced by mitochondria. So the suggestion would be that these would be the, exactly the regions one would expect to be degenerated in the context of an energy crisis in the brain. And that's quite convenient because Lewy bodies are proposed to affect cellular health by their impact upon mitochondrial functioning. Um, so this is something we're interested in exploring, that perhaps the vulnerability of particular classes of neurons is related to the normal energy requirements of these cells in the context of a disease that, in which mitochondria are strongly implicated. So one of the regions I'll talk about first um, is the nucleus basalis of Maynard. So this is a part of the brain that's really important in most dementia disorders because it produces the neuromodulator acetylcholine. So I guess most people will know that acetylcholine or the loss of acetylcholine is strongly implicated in many dementia disorders, including Lewy body dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And as a result, the majority of drugs that are currently used to uh, treat dementia disorders uh, target the cholinergic system. And the nucleus basalis of Maynard is, is located sort of just below the, the basal ganglia structures. It uh, is responsible for cortical cholinergic innervation, and it's well known to degenerate in Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body dementia. Like all of the regions I've just discussed, this is a part of the brain that has really high energy demand and would be expected to degenerate in the context of impaired cellular energy production. So we decided to test this hypothesis uh, using postmortem brain tissue. We used control cases and Lewy body dementia cases, obviously as our main comparators, but we also used asymptomatic incidental Lewy body disease cases. Now these are a pretty rare class of uh, disease class. They have no disease, but they have Lewy bodies throughout the brain. And these are two cases that have Lewy body pathology that would be expected um, to, to correlate with dementia symptoms, but we have confirmation until very close to the time of death, these people were completely cognitively intact at the time they died. So they're, they're unusual in that they have Lewy bodies, but, but, but none of the apparent um, pathological changes that would give rise to symptoms. And what we did is we looked at the mitochondrial respiratory chain. I appreciate lots of people here probably are not so interested in mitochondria or may not be familiar with the mitochondrial respiratory chain. 
It's really beyond the scope of what I'm going to talk about today to describe in depth how mitochondria work. But suffice it to say that we look at the mitochondrial respiratory chain as a proxy measure of how mitochondria are functioning. And we know that there are changes in the mitochondrial respiratory chain in Parkinson's disease, substantia nigra, for example, um, in established Parkinson's disease. So we did this using immunofluorescence um, on a confocal microscope. We imaged individual neurons, uh, approximately 50 per case. We labeled the neurons with choline acetal transferase, which is a, a protein marker of cholinergic neurons. And we looked at NDFB8, which is a marker of complex one of the mitochondrial respiratory chain, and COX-4, which is a marker of, co of complex four. And we normalized the respiratory chain markers to a general mitochondrial marker called PORIN. And the idea behind this was to evaluate whether there were specific changes to the mitochondrial respiratory chain that could not be explained by changes in the number of mitochondria per cell. And what we found, I think, was really interesting. Uh, we found nothing with complex four, so I'll not talk about that again. But with complex one, we observed a specific reduction in this, but only in the symptomatic cases, the symptomatic Lewy body disease cases. So those individuals that had um, Lewy bodies throughout the brain, but no clinical symptoms, had no to the control population. Whereas in the Lewy body dementia cases, we saw a, a particularly big loss of complex one. And we saw a more variable loss of complex four that didn't reach significance on the group level. What was also interesting, I haven't really, uh, I haven't put a graph in of it here, but we also saw an increase in the number of mitochondria in both the symptomatic and asymptomatic Lewy body dementia cases. So um, I'm going to touch about, upon that a little bit more um, in the future, but, but just bear it in mind that we find this. I should also point out that the loss of complex one was still significant, even if we didn't normalize the number of mitochondria. So in other words, it wasn't just that there was an increase in mitochondria and that gave the illusory per perception that we had a loss of complex one when they were normalized. What was also really interesting is that the reduction in complex one trended towards a correlation with cell loss in these, which would suggest that the reduction in the yeah, mitochondrial respiratory chain may be related to the health of cells, but it was just, just not significant. Um, so the question I'm normally asked at this stage is, well, surely the difference between the symptomatic and asymptomatic cases is the number of Lewy bodies. So in other words, the incidental, not asymptomatic cases did not have a significant loss of complex one of the mitochondrial respiratory chain or loss of cells simply because they had less Lewy bodies. And I think that's a really reasonable question um, in the context of what we think we know about Lewy bodies. But it's actually the opposite of what we found. So I just draw your attention here to this is uh, the most severely affected case uh, of Lewy body dementia in terms of clinical symptoms and also degree of respiratory chain dysfunction. So the greatest loss of complex one of the mitochondrial respiratory chain. And you can see, yeah, there are definitely, you know, Lewy bodies here. There are definitely Lewy neurites, but it's nowhere near on the same level as this case, which was completely cognitively intact up until the time of death. Um, and I think this is probably because this case has more cells in which to manifest Lewy bodies and more cellular processes in which to manifest Lewy neurites. Um, but I'm just putting that in there because it's a question I'm always asked. So, but this made us ask, what exactly is the relevance of Lewy bodies to what we're observing? So we then decided to look at complex one labeled by NDFB8, again, normalized to a general mitochondrial marker porin in cells with Lewy bodies labeled here with a fibril specific um, antibody uh, compared to cells without Lewy bodies, just in the Lewy body dementia uh, and, and asymptomatic LBD cases. And what we observed is pretty much the opposite of what you would expect. We observed that the greatest loss of complex one was observed in those cells without Lewy bodies. And in fact, the cells with Lewy bodies appeared to have amongst the highest levels of complex one. This was also the same if we looked at cells that contained what we described as diffuse alpha-synuclein accumulations. So this is alpha-synuclein that is accumulated, but is not actually formed into a distinct Lewy body at that time. So really to summarize this little bit of work, um, what the data seem to suggest is that the energy impairment may be related to cell loss in terms of the mitochondrial complex one deficiency may be related to the loss of neurons. That's quite speculative because this is obviously an observational study, so we can't prove causation. We can say that there is a relationship and it's worthy of further study. 
Again, and with the same caveats of this being an observational study, it would seem to suggest that Lewy bodies, at least in this cellular population, may be protective, at least in the context of the mitochondrial respiratory chain. And one potential mechanism that may underlie this um, is based on what I said earlier about there being higher levels of porin or the mit general mitochondrial marker in cells, in nucleus based cells of Maynard neurons in LBD. And this is because uh, when mitochondria cannot be recycled through a process called mitophagy, they become very toxic to neurons. Uh, this is because they produce reactive oxygen species, um, which is why it's very important for it, particularly the health of neurons that, that mitophagy takes place. And there's some speculation that mitophagy may be, a pair, may be impaired in Lewy body dementia. So one could speculate that Lewy bodies may perform a protective function in this instance by encapsulating damaged organelles like mitochondria in the context of general impairments in the recycling of intracellular organelles or macromolecules. And some support for this hypothesis uh, is actually been published quite recently in Nature Neuroscience by a group who showed that looking at the fine structure of Lewy bodies with electron microscopy revealed what appeared to be dystrophic mitochondria within Lewy bodies. So this would suggest that for some reason, damaged mitochondria are occurring in Lewy bodies. Of course, it could be that Lewy bodies are sequestering mitochondria and damaging them, but it could also be that they're perhaps protecting the cell by performing a function somewhat similar to a waste paper bin um, in the context of, of damaged uh, cellular recycling processes. But another part of the brain I really want to talk about, and this is, you know, the stuff that I've just presented there is stuff that I presented at AAIC. So I want to take this a bit further and sort of expand upon this story by looking at the neocortex. The neocortex is obviously the, the convoluted surface of the brain. Uh, it contains broadly two classes of neurons. The In green here, the pyramidal neurons. So this is from uh, control frontal cortex. Uh, so you've got in green pyramidal neurons. Uh, these are projection neurons. They, they project information across different parts of the brain. And in red, we have interneurons, in this case, labeled with the calcium binding protein parvalbumin. That's uh, a significant point because this is a particular subclass of interneurons. And these coordinate the firing of the pyramidal neurons into the rhythmic patterns of activity termed oscillations that are really important for our, our higher cognitive functions. And the part of the brain I'm gonna talk about um, is the prefrontal cortex for reasons I'll explain in a minute. But what I wanted to say about these two classes of neurons is it's a really good test of the hypothesis that energy requirements underlie neural vulnerability for two reasons. Number one, pyramidal neurons have much lower energy demands than fast spiking interneurons. So these are the interneurons that are labeled by the calcium binding protein parvalbumin. So these neurons, the parvalbumin interneurons are really, really have really high activity patterns. Um, and this requires a very efficient production of energy. Um, they have very high levels of mitochondria to support this and they're very susceptible to mitochondrial dysfunction. In contrast, pyramidal neurons have a much lower rate of activity, a lower uh, degree of reliance on, um, on energy production, but they are also the only neurons in the, in the cortex that develop Lewy bodies. So Lewy bodies never develop into neurons. Um, so the part of the brain I will discuss is the prefrontal cortex uh, for two reasons. It's one of many regions that we are investigating in this context. But for Lewy body dementia, it's a particularly important part of the brain because it has important uh, roles in executive functioning uh, that is thought to be impaired in LBD and give rise to the attentional symptoms such as fluctuating cognition, whereby an individual has fluctuating periods of inattentiveness um, interspersed by periods of near normal functioning that strongly implicates dysfunction of the prefrontal cortex. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so the first thing we did uh, in, in this particular part of the study was we performed stereological analysis. So this is a method whereby we take a thick section, three thick sections of tissue. Uh, we count the number of neurons using specialist software and it gives us an idea of the density of neurons. And the first thing that, that was really quite significant, I think, um, is that we observed a significant loss in, uh, in fast spiking interneurons labeled by parvalbumin. Um, this was particularly interesting because as I said before, these are neurons that do not develop Lewy bodies uh, in any case um, that has ever been reported in the literature as far as I'm aware. In contrast, pyramidal neurons, the neurons that, uh, that do develop Lewy bodies, 
uh, showed no significant uh, change in density. I will attach a huge caveat here, which is that the prefrontal cortex is not very severely affected by Lewy bodies. So whilst it does have Lewy bodies, it's nowhere near as seriously uh, affected um, as maybe the temporal cortex, for example. So that may be an explanation of that. Um, when we looked at the mitochondrial respiratory chain as before, and we focused on complex one here, um, we observed as before a significant reduction in complex one of the mitochondrial respiratory chain in the parvalbumin interneurons and a complete absence of alpha synuclein pathology. With uh, pyramidal neurons, we actually observed exactly the same thing. So we observed a significant reduction of about similar magnitude, about one standard deviation on average, um, loss of complex one of the mitochondrial respiratory chain. Uh, in contrast to our studies in the nucleus base cells of Maynard, we did not observe any difference in complex one expression between neurons with and without Lewy bodies. Also, contrary to our findings in the nucleus base cells of Maynard, we did not observe an increase in the number of mitochondria. In fact, we observed a trend towards a decrease in the number of mitochondria in LBD that appeared to be particularly marked in neurons with Lewy bodies. Although this didn't reach significance, um, it certainly seemed that the trend was very strongly that way. Um, what we also observed was that individual Lewy bodies um, appeared to sequester quite high levels of, of the complex one marker NDFB8, and this was strongly co-localized with alpha synuclein. What was particularly interesting is we normally expect, we would expect complex one to be within mitochondria. But as you can see here, the general mitochondrial marker porin was not completely um, co-localized with complex one. And there appears to be some level of complex one immunoreactivity that is not um, also immunoreactive for porin. Um, I probably should have taken better pictures to show this more clearly with just these two. But um, obviously, if anyone wants, I can send them. And this is really interesting because it suggests a, a particular interaction between alpha synuclein and complex one that's been described before, but, but shown here, um, I think for the first time with immunofluorescence in brain tissue, although I, I may be wrong. It may have been demonstrated by somebody else. So what was also really interesting is, so as I said, the prefrontal cortex is a part of the brain that we think is, is implicated in transient changes uh, in cognitive function known as cognitive fluctuations. So changes the attentiveness and, uh, and awareness over time. What's really interesting and what I think is really difficult for the neuropathology field to um, explain in LBD is how a permanent neuropathological change such as a Lewy body or a lot of Lewy bodies could give rise to a transient clinical symptom like cognitive fluctuations. But interneurons uh, or the loss of interneurons is actually really consistent with the idea of transient changes to consciousness on the basis that um, interneurons regulate the firing of uh, ensembles of neurons. And we know in disorders where there is impaired interneuron functioning, such as epilepsy, you get transient changes in, in awareness. You can also get visual hallucinations. Um, and these are, are, are by their very nature transient and result from impaired or changes to the oscillations of cortical activity. So therefore we decided to see whether the interneuron changes we'd observed in the prefrontal cortex were related to cognitive fluctuations using a, a clinical instrument known as the clinical assessment of fluctuation or CAF, which is a very basic measure that was obtained when these individuals were alive as they were all part of uh, prospective clinical studies. Uh, and they're a marker of the severity and frequency of cognitive fluctuations. Uh, sorry, the duration and frequency of cognitive fluctuations. And what we observed, I think really interestingly, was that the density of parvalumin interneurons was correlated with CAF score, uh, as was the reduction in complex one correlated with CAF score. And we saw a trend towards a relationship with um, the ratio of parvalumin interneurons to pyramidal neurons with CAF score. So in other words, the loss of uh, parvalumin interneurons and the loss of complex one from parvalumin interneurons was associated with the severity of cognitive fluctuations. To summarize all this, bring it all together, um, this part of the study anyway, um, it was seen that interneuron reductions in the prefrontal cortex and DLB are related to cognitive fluctuations, again, by association and not necessarily showing causation. Um, the complex one reductions also seem to be um, related with cognitive fluctuations, but we also observe this with pyramidal neurons. So the hypothesis we're working on at this stage is that 
interneurons and pyramidal neurons are equally affected by mitochondrial impairments, um, but we would hypothesize that interneurons would be more vulnerable to degeneration in the context of the same impairment. And that's something we're actively studying at this very moment um, with model systems, and we'll hopefully report on that sometime next year. And as I said before, the loss of these fast spiking interneurons is actually really consistent with transient changes in executive function and is a very plausible link between pathological changes to the brain and cognitive fluctuations, a transient symptom. So to bring everything together for, from the, both the regions we have today, we would suggest that, that neural loss and energy impairments um, are linked, um, or at least there's evidence to suggest they may be linked, and that it is the reliance or the vulnerability of the vulnerability of neurons to degeneration is based on their energy requirements. And the loss of energy um, homeostasis uh, is probably underlying some forms of degeneration anyway, rather than the presence or absence of Lewy bodies. Um, and this also probably, or at least possibly, relates to symptoms. What I think is really interesting, and I haven't really emphasized it so much, but it probably bears further discussion, is that we observe differences in the mitochondrial respiratory chain between nucleus basalis of minor neurons and cortical pyramidal neurons, actually almost opposite effects. Technology has different effects on distinct populations of neurons. It may also be the case that the Lewy bodies are qualitatively different in the nucleus basalis of Maynard compared to the neocortex. That's something that needs to be studied further and something again that we're we are exploring with model systems. So as with all of this, um, there's loads of people to thank. I've listed a lot of them here. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and I would be really happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. That was fascinating. And some awesome imagery there as well. I think I'd have so much fun kind of creating some of those images. That you... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is certainly the fun thing working with the brain is looking at really amazing images. Of... It is. I mean, it's such a kind of sci-fi background. You look like you could be looking at a part of the galaxy when you do that. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Well, um, thank you very much, everybody, for paying a uh, attention during the talk and apologies it looks like a couple of people had problems accessing via zoom i, I should reassure you that you it, it just requires you to register an account you don't have to be at ucl to do that um you can register an account in your own name but it, it's just to keep out people who who um will be here to spoil it uh, rather than any kind of security measure but thank you very much everybody seems to have found us on youtube um so we are going to take your questions now uh, if you have any questions and you're watching on YouTube, you can drop those into the uh, comments box. And if you're on Zoom, you can use the Q&A box on your bottom of your screen. Uh, we do already have one question, which I'm gonna to put to you now, uh, uh, Dan. Uh, Galliano Limarenko asks, uh, such interesting work from, uh, now I'm gonna try and get all the pronunciations right, uh, from metabolic alteration point of view, how these, how these changes, especially in mitochondria, and lack of uh, glycosis in neurons under pathological condition LBD, PD, AD relate to regulated metabolic, metabolic rather, uh, changes and shut down in hibernation, hibernating animals. Does that make? Yeah, any, yeah, I'm reading the question I mean, here as well. The second part of the question afterwards, if you want to address that bit first. Yeah, so um, yeah, well, firstly, thank you for, for describing the work as interesting. That's really, really kind, uh, thank you. Um, in terms of the, uh, so you said from the metabolic alteration point of view, how do these changes in mitochondria and lack of glycolysis in neurons relate to regulated metabolic changes in hibernating animals, animals? I have to say that is not something that I had, a parallel I had ever drawn with this work. Uh, certainly I agree regarding, on the point regarding glycolysis in neurons, um, because, because as, you, as you correctly say, uh, glycolysis is not really performed by neurons. It is, however, performed a lot by astrocytes, the supporting cells of neurons, which are, um, which are also, we think, probably affected by alpha cytonucleon pathology. Um, and indeed, we've evidence of that, and we're studying that as well. Um, so I've never really thought about it, but um, I, I guess the point that you've made is that you're talking about hibernation as something that is planned or something that, that, that evolution has um, enabled or equipped certain animals to do, something obviously that humans don't do. And I think the difference that we're talking about here is uh, this is obviously not regulated and it's probably not something 
that is intentional, although it may well be. I mean, it, it's equally plausible, I guess, that, that the respiratory chain changes that we're seeing may be an attempt by neurons to protect from the harmful production of reactive oxygen species. So they could be adaptive potentially, but, but I'm less inclined to think that given the relationship with uh, neuronal loss that we've observed, um, albeit with the caveat that it is observational. Um, am I okay to answer the second part? Yeah, I was gonna say the, the second part of the question. Well, do you want to read that out? I'll let you read that. And um, could this be reversible in human brains similar to Astubators. I, I must apologize. I don't know what an astubator is. Um, before the system collapses into irreversible cascade of pathological events. I mean, I, I think it would be great. The, the key question, and I think something that, that has been alluded to here is, is a chicken and egg question. Um, in other words, uh, what comes first, mitochondrial dysfunction or alpha-synuclein pathology? Um, obviously, if alpha-synuclein pathology is inducing the mitochondrial changes, treating the mitochondrial changes would be like putting a sticking plaster on a wound. It wouldn't um, address the underlying issue, which in that case would be alpha-synuclein pathology. So I think it probably would be helpful, but I, I think we really need to drill down and really understand what is driving these changes. If it's mitochondrial, is it a primary mitochondrial uh, change or is it a, a mitochondrial change that's occurring secondarily to alpha-synuclein pathology? To put my sort of two cents in, I do not think that it's likely that Lewy body dementia is a primary mitochondrial disease. Um, I work within the Welcome Center for Mitochondrial Research here at Newcastle. Uh, we have a huge uh, collection of postmortem mitochondrial disease brains that, that I look at. Uh, the Lewy body disease brains are very, very different uh, from the mitochondrial disease brains for, for two main reasons. Mitochondrial diseases are a very diverse, uh, very diverse in terms of their clinical and pathological presentation. But one of the few constants is cerebellar degeneration and often visual cortex degeneration. And these are two regions that are remarkably preserved in Lewy body dementia. So I would be inclined to think that, that it's not a primary mitochondrial issue, but probably something that's occurring secondarily to something else, which may be alpha synuclein aggregation. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your uh, question, Galia, um, Galina. Um, if anybody else has any questions, you can... Oh. Person now. Um, thank you very much for your perspective. Enjoyed the talk. <laughs> that was a reply from uh, Galena. Thank you very much. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, you can post those now. I realize that um, not all of our audience, I, I think we probably uh, are presenting mostly to people who are interested in, very specifically in this field today. I wonder whether there's a couple of points to ha perhaps make for those that um, aren't as, as expert in this field field as, as you Dan to just to suggest what are the main areas of focus for researchers looking at Lewy body dementia at the moment? Um, I think I think there's lots there's lots of stuff that people are really interested in one of the one of the main laboratory side investigations is the idea that, that Lewy body pathology may spread through the brain uh, it's sometimes called prion like spread so the suggestion that the pathology may spread between neurons um, along anatomical pathways. And this is really interesting because um, it's quite intuitive because it tends to develop in a, in a particular sequence, but it's also quite a hopeful message because the suggestion would be if you can stop it spreading, you would stop the, the clinical progression. Um, I think that's a really interesting area. One thing that particularly interests me in that context is um, it's maybe a little bit oversimplistic. And I think there's a growing realization of this in the field because if we assumed it was just spreading, you would assume that all neurons would become affected, but that's not what we see. We see very specific types of neurons that develop Lewy bodies, um, actually relatively few. In the grand scheme of the number of different types of neurons in the brain, it's the minority that really develop Lewy bodies. So, uh, and there's been some really interesting work on this by Virginia Lee um, and others that have shown that it may be the normal expression of the protein alpha synuclein that mediates that vulnerability. And that's something that we've worked on in the past as well. Um, some other particularly interesting areas, I think lipidomics is a big interesting area at the minute. The idea that well, these are protein aggregates, that, that changes in how lipids are handled in the brain may give rise to Lewy bodies is really interesting. There's been some very uh, interesting work in the last year or two using high powered um, uh, microscopy techniques that suggest that the core of Lewy bodies might be composed of lipid membranes. That's really interesting. Incidentally, something I was going to discuss today, 
was our own study of lipids in, in um, LVD tissue, where we found alterations in lipid metabolism that seem to correlate with the degree of Lewy body pathology. However, um, my mass spec data has still not arrived. So um, I didn't want to give half a stud story. So maybe that's something I can present sometime in the future, but we're waiting lipidomic profiling um, to, to, to really elaborate on that. And I don't like presenting stuff that's, um, it's not really, um, it's not finished and it's too speculative. No, I, I understand. Um, we've uh, had a couple more questions come through as well. Um, ooh, I can't, I don't know who this is because they didn't put their own name, but um, one of the questions is, I, they'd be interested in your thoughts on how Lewy body de uh, dementia has synergistic effects with other neurodegenerative diseases, which uh, it commonly co-occurs. How do different pathologies interact if they do? Oh, it's yeah. uh, Simon uh, Wheeler from the Alzheimer's Society that asked that question. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think this is a really interest. This is a really, really interesting topic. Uh, something I feel a little um, under-equipped to comment on because it's not something I've particularly looked at. But to just give my sort of two cents on it, um, th there really is no question that um, that it would appear that that Alzheimer type pathology is really common in Lewy body dementia. Um, from looking at our own cohort here at Newcastle. Um, one thing that I think is really clear is that if you have Alzheimer type pathology, you're much more likely to have um, dementia. And there's been really good studies. I can't remember the groups in question that have shown that tau in particular um, in LBD as, as evaluated by neuroimaging um, is a really strong predictor of cognitive decline in LBD. So there's no question that there is, um, that there is some sort of synergistic effect going on. How that happens or where that happens, I think is really difficult to answer. From my kind of general point, I don't usually see um, tau and alpha synuclein within the same neuron uh, outside the amygdala. I think that's been reported on before, um, but there's no question that there is something interesting going on between these two. And, um, and it would be really interesting to know, to know how. So it's one of my colleagues, um, Lauren Walker is actually looking at this at the minute, uh, or hoping to, to further explore this. And I think it's, it really is a question that needs to be answered because, because it has such a strong bearing on outcomes for patients. Um, hope that thank answers you. your question. That's all right. Thank you um, for the question and thank you for answering that. Dan, we, we, I think we did have a few problems with your freezing there as well, but we can oh, still sorry. hear you perfect. No, we can still hear you perfectly. Maybe somebody in the next room suddenly turned on Netflix. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the next question comes from Yuzu Yu, who asked a great talk. Sorry if he uh, missed this because I know he, he joined a little bit uh, after the start. But do you have any insights uh, or hypothesis into the molecular mechanisms of how Lewy body led to uh, mitotoxicity uh, and the behavioral impact of this? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. And um, something I guess that I that I sort of inadvertently alluded to is that interneurons um, do not normally manifest Lewy bodies. So of the cells that we've looked at, um, that are subject to degeneration, apparently to degeneration anyway, um, only one of them gets Lewy bodies. So the, the cholinergic neurons of the nucleus basalis, the interneurons don't. So the question is, why are they becoming affected? And I think that's, that's a really great question. Unfortunately, one that's very difficult to answer. To give a sort of speculative answer, my guess would be that there is some evidence in rodents that interneurons don't normally contain high levels of protein alpha synuclein. So by that, I mean the, the normal physiological protein, not the pathological aggregated form, um, is not really present in interneurons. So my hypothesis would be that oligomers uh, or, or pre-alpha synuclein aggregates that are not quite Lewy bodies are probably present in most cells in the brain at the terminal stages of disease. But they only manifest as something we can see under a microscope, i.e. a Lewy body, if there is alpha synuclein in that cell. And it relates to what I was saying with prion-like spread, where you have a protein aggregate that basically sucks in the normal protein, and that's how it's called elongation, verbal elongation. That's how it seems that the protein aggregate forms. So if you don't have that native protein present, I think it's quite plausible that you would just have aggregates floating about in a cell. And there's, a, I think, a converging, maybe, I wouldn't say converging, but there is a view within the field that suggests that these pre-aggregates of alpha synuclein that are not quite Lewy bodies may be more toxic to cells. Um, so actually the cells without Lewy bodies may be more severely affected because they have not developed Lewy bodies. 
because well, the Lewy body may draw up these, these otherwise very toxic, smaller aggregates of alpha-synuclein and prevent them from causing cellular toxicity, perhaps through, through damage to mitochondria. In terms of the mechanism, there is some evidence that uh, alpha-synuclein aggregates, again, not Lewy bodies, smaller than Lewy bodies, can cause um, very small pores to form on mitochondrial membranes. And I guess the, the so the, the programmed cell death messenger, the apoptosis inducing factor is held between both mitochondrial membranes. So if you had holes forming in that membrane, you would have the release of, of, of AIF, which would basically tell the cell to kill itself. So, I mean, that, that's one plausible explanation, but you know, probably not the right one, but an important one to study nonetheless. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was a, a good question. Um, last chance now, if anybody has any final questions, um, you can post those now. I'm, uh, Dan and I spoke last week and it's not the focus of today's topic, but I, I wondered if I, I just, I can't help but mention that, that you, um, I, I thought was fascinating about your story about how you came to be involved in uh, dementia research and just making the point that you're not somebody who started out as a career scientist that that kind of came to this from school to university to a master's and PhD you've had a an unconventional route to get to where you are which is amazingly inspirational um, it's not the focus of today's topic but I, I would be interested to know what message you might have for anybody watching who who isn't a scientist in their kind of late teens and early 20s that might think about coming to this later yeah, so I mean, um, sorry, so off of, topic. I'm no, no, no. <laughs> I'm more, more than happy to talk about this because it's actually something I feel really passionately about. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I didn't go to university until I was twenty-three. I left school at sixteen. Um, I had no real interest in working in academia. It's something that genuinely found me. I know that probably sounds ridiculously cliched, but but it just was something that happened. I was in a pretty unrewarding job in a bank. And um, I basically just thought I wanted something more from life, particularly something that, that would challenge me, that would, that would give me the feeling that I was genuinely contributing to helping people, um, something that I definitely did not feel in the finance industry. Um, if anything, the opposite, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, it was, um, it was a decision I made. I went back to university, um, made some uh, risky decisions, but ones that thankfully paid off. Um, and, and yeah, here I am. So I, I guess in terms of advice I would give people is it, it's never too late. I mean, 23 is not, or maybe it was 25 actually. Um, sometime in my twenties, I can't actually remember what age I was, but, but um, it, it's, it's not really too late. And to be perfectly honest, I can't imagine myself doing anything but this now. Um, it genuinely is a part of me. There's plenty of other jobs I could do and probably could be okay at, but I wouldn't love it the way I love this. And I think that's something that's really important to, the, to, to have that genuine love and, and just, just thirst for, for wanting to study things is, is just amazing. Um, in terms of, uh, of inspiring people, uh, I, don't, I don't know about that, but, but what I can say is that I think that although my path to, to research has been unconventional, I think it makes me better at my job um, because I know what it's like to work in different industries. I know what pressure and demand is. Um, and I also know that what it's like to be in a job that you really, really don't like. Um, and therefore, it makes it so much easier to work in a job like this one where I absolutely love coming into work. I absolutely love doing my work. Um, and it makes such a big difference knowing what the alternative is, I think. So if you're out there and you, you know, suppose you're doing something else and you're thinking, should I make the leap? You know, if it's something that you really love, I, I think it'll come through in your work personally. Honestly, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I find that we could do a whole separate webinar on that. And we are going to do, we are starting a piece of work right now to try and encourage young people to, to turn to the dementia research or to people working in different uh, professions to kind of bring their skills and knowledge to, to dementia where it's, it's very much needed. Uh, and uh, honestly, I, I hope we can talk in more on that subject again in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. We're really grateful for, uh, uh, for you agreeing to share your work with us today. So thank you, Dr. Daniel Erskine. You can find uh, Dan on his Twitter. His name is at Daniel Erskine, but the I is a uh, number one. 
Um, but we'll also put a link to his uh, profile in the feed that goes with this as well. So please do go look him up and give him a follow. I know he tweets about his work and I'm sure we'll be presenting at the upcoming Alzheimer's Research UK conference in March, which is just um, is open for um, abstract submission at the moment. And you can book that now. And of course, at the AAIC, which we now know is going to be in the Netherlands next July. So we'll be looking forward to those, Dan. Um, our next webinar will take place at 4 p.m. GMT on the 9th of December, when we'll welcome Gina Martin. Gina worked for National Geographic for 21 years and is the founder and executive director of the Bob and Diane Fund, an award uh, for visual storytelling around Alzheimer's and dementia. So a little bit of a different change to uh, a rather non-scientific topic next time. Uh, Gina is going to share the story of how the Bomb Diane Fund came to life and the, pro um, and the process that brought about that and provide a, um, a glimpse into the trajectory of her mother's uh, illness which, uh, and father who really inspired this, this fund. Um, the recording from today, as I mentioned before, is uh, available on our website as is also the details on how to book for our next webinar, um, which you can find at Dementia Researcher nihr.ac.uk forward slash uh, webinars. Um, um, finally, if you'd like to join us and present your own research as a midday lecture, please drop us a line through the contact page on our website or DM us on Twitter using hash uh, at dem underscore researcher. Um, finally, uh, last plug for our website, which is packed full of information, which is all there to help early career researchers, including all of our previous webinars, our regular podcast series, and now um, uh, regular bloggers as well, and, and the usual things, including funding opportunities, event, uh, events and, and jobs and things which we collate there for you. That's it. We're done. Thank you very much, Daniel, um, for joining us today. And uh, thank you very much to everybody who uh, asked questions. As I said, do, if you didn't get a chance to ask today, do look Dan up on Twitter and I'm sure he'd be happy to, um, to reply to you there as well. Thank you very much and we'll say goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>